I have pressed the button. We are live now, actually. Okay, okay, yes. Uh, good morning to all. Uh, welcome to EXRX India and uh, see Samraj Health Services Private Limited for the students, by the students webinars. We are moving towards a world record event. And uh, today we are having a 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, web series. And uh, now uh, the topic is Lymphedema and its physiotherapy management will be presented by Dr. Prachi Butch, uh, MPT student from Dr. D.Y. Patil College of Physiotherapy, Pune. And uh, I welcome my uh, EXRX uh, India team members, uh, Dr. Rupesh and uh, Professor Duna. Now I welcome Dr. Prachi Butch to con continue the session, please. Let's see you share your screen now, once again. Please continue. I'll start. Yes, yes. We'll start. Please. So, good morning, everyone. Our today's topic is lymphedema and its physiotherapy management. So, the lymph lymphatic system is a part of body's immune system that plays a role in fighting harmful cells. For example, bacteria. It consists of lymph fluid, lymph nodes, lymph vessels, and lymph tissues. So, what is lymphedema? Um. Hello? Yes, Prachi. Any uh, problem? Uh, yes, I think the screen is not moving. It might be taking a little time. You just click on the screen. Yes, I have. OK. Yeah. OK. So uh, lymphatic obstruction is a blockage of lymph vessel that drains fluid and immune cells from tissue throughout the body. And obstruction could cause an impaired contraction of the collecting lymphatics, causing lymphedema. So what is lymphedema? It is abnormal accumulation of protein-rich fluid in the interstitium. So it can be described as swelling that may occur in arms or legs because of the blockages in the lymphatic system. So there are two types of lymphedema. Uh, we usually come across the secondary lymphedema, which is acquired lymphedema. But there is a primary lymphedema, which is idiopathic lymphedema. So we'll see uh, what is primary lymphedema. It happens due to malformation of lymph vessels. So approximately one in 6,000 people develop this primary lymphedema. Uh, this form isn't inherited through the family history, and it wouldn't be passed on to future generations. But it, people can develop primary lymphedema in relation to other genetic and congenital abnormalities where the lymph nodes or lymph vessels don't develop properly. So primary lymphedema can be idiopathic, intrinsic or spontaneous. Now everyone knows what's idiopathic. It's an unknown cause. Intrinsic is which results from an abnormal lymphatic system. So the lymphatic system doesn't uh, function properly. And the spontaneous is uh, the condition that has developed on its own without any interference of another systems. So it develops on its own, uh, that is uh, spontaneous lymphedema. So uh, primary lymphedema, the congenital one is seen, uh, is least common, approximately 2%. Uh, more common to de developing male infants compared to female. Symptoms displayed shortly after birth commonly affects lower extremities. Now lymphedema precox. So um, most common prevalent type of primary lymphedema it's higher incidence rates in females during adolescent age. It's unilateral foot or calf usually affected. Now what is this? This is the condition characterized by swelling of soft tissues in which excessive amount of fluid has accumulated. Uh, the third is lymphedema tarda. So what is that? It's a congenital disease characterized by underdevelopment of lymphatic pathways. So it occurs in older adults that have weak immune system. So this is primary lymphedema. Now we'll go to secondary lymphedema. So it's more common than the primary form. Uh, the lymphatic system is damaged due to external cause compromising the function of the lymph nodes. Consequently, swelling accumulates in the affected part of the body. So uh, li secondary lymphedema has many causes, the, uh, infection, trauma, malignant tumors, radiotherapy, surgery, diseases, 
inflammation obesity now we'll see the etiology so uh, the for the primary causes in the secondary causes so as i said uh, it can be idiopathic uh, hereditary or developmental abnormalities that is aplasia hyperplasia and hypoplasia now what's aplasia it's the failure of an organ or tissue to develop to the functional normality so it doesn't develop fully functional uh, then there is hyperplasia where enlargement of the organ occurs or increasing amount of uh, organic tissues occur so that is hyperplasia it occurs in 75% of the cases uh, and then uh, in 15% of the cases and then there is hypoplasia it is the under development of the tissues or organ so now seeing at the secondary causes so one first is filariasis it's mosquito bite or parasitic infection then there is primary or metabolic neoplasm benign or malignant everyone knows cancer then there is surgery lymph node dissection or removal uh, which usually post uh, in cancer surgeries they do radiation treatment or chemotherapy severe infection or trauma chronic venous insufficiency obesity or iatrogenic uh, iatrogenic uh, iatrogenic is uh, related to illness caused by any medical examination or treatment uh, due to that uh, lymphedema can occur uh, and the last is hiv or aids now what is the clinical representation what all physical changes occur in a body due to lymphedema so first is swelling in the arm or a leg uh then there can be pitting edema in the early stages fibrosis can occur limbs can feel heavy and achy there is altered sensation for example pins and needles burning or there can be no sensation it's either way some develop altered sensation some do not develop any sensation uh then reduce mobility and range of movement of the affected limbs a uh, pain and joint discomfort skin changes for example redness and increased temperature there can be nail discoloration there can be hyperkeratosis that is, what is hyperkeratosis it's a uh, thickening of the outer layer of the skin which com uh, com is composed of keratin so it's a thickening of that layer then there is lymphangiectasia uh, it is pathologic dilation of lymph vessels then there, there are recurring infections hardening thickening or tightness of skin loss of hair and loss of sleep over the time uh, if the lower limb is affected in this lymphedema the person's gait pattern is also altered leading to a higher risk of disability now along with the physical changes psychological changes also occur so the psychological effects their swelling and weight gain impact physical appearance that can affect one's perception of how they look consequently decreasing their self confidence so in these kind of patients usually there is lack of family support and it occurs uh, in the you know uh, those who are poor mainly occurs in those because they don't take care of themselves so the people detach themselves uh, from social events family friends uh, and it leads to isolation so due to that their sleeping pattern is also disturbed some people may feel they have lack of support financial concerns uh, as a consequence of treatment cost and potential job loss uh, they usually people have financial concerns because the cancer treatment is so long after that the radiation therapies chemotherapy and then this lymphedema so it affects psychologically uh, the survivors that have acquired lymphedema feel that it can it can be a constant reminder of previously having a cancer uh, so for those who experience unilateral lymphedema common different size uh, of garments have to be worn on each side of the body uh so these can largely impact a person because they might not feel comfortable uh, the way they look or therefore and therefore exclude themselves from public situations so moving on to stages of lymphedema there are four stages stage 0 is latency stage stage 1 it's reversible stage 2 it's spontaneously irreversible and stage 3 that is lymphostatic elephantiasis 
so stage zero that is latency here lymph transport capacity is reduced but no clinical edema is seen so uh, the patient doesn't develop the accumulation of lymph uh, only the transport capacity is reduced here then uh, stage one that is reversible here pitting edema reduces with elevation increase in edema with increase in uh, activity heat and humidity so if the patient is performing regular exercises and uh, is performing the physiotherapy management properly then this type uh, stage 1 uh, lymphedema is reversible it can be reduced uh, stage 2 spontaneously irreversible lymphedema edema with evidence of fibrosis uh it does not resolve overnight and does not regress with elevation uh increasingly more difficult to pit skin and tissue changes are present in severe stage 2 so when the stage 2 is there uh even if you elevate the arm the lymphedema doesn't go away uh you have to perform vigorous exercises and the compression bandage and mld techniques uh then it would not uh, it would prevent further uh, progression to lymph uh, to stage 3 uh, so moving to stage 3 severe non pitting fibrotic edema with significant increase in connective and in scar tissue trophic changes are evident hardening uh, in duration of dermal tissues skin folds and uh, papillomas and hyperkeratosis occur in this stage Uh, all the stages of lymphedema are given by international society of lymphology so here you can see the pre stage is stage 0 then there stage 1 where it's reversible stage 2 where it is spontaneously irreversible but if you do vigorous exercises and uh, perform uh, physiotherapy uh, it can be prevented from further progressing to stage 3 uh, stage 3 is elephantiasis now we'll see to uh, diagnostic test so first is lymphoscintigraphy now what is that it's a special type of nuclear medicine imaging it helps evaluate body's lymphatic system uh, then there is mri then there is mrl mr lymphography techniques so that is also kind of imaging that is used to uh, visualize and map lymphatic vessels then there is a ct scan uh, perometry perometry is uh, most used uh, it's uh, the ir radiations infrared radiations uh, which are uh, applied to the limb and then the measurements of circumference uh, are done uh, then there is patient reported symptom assessment uh, bio impedance analysis ultrasonography dexa scan uh, dexa is for bone density scans dual energy x ray absorptiometry uh, progress can be measured by lymph circumference and water displacement usually we measure uh, we compare both the sides of lymph circumference when we are uh, doing any diagnosis or checking for prog progression then palliative care the world health organization defines palliative care as an approach that uh, improves the quality of life of patients uh, adults and children and their families who are facing problem hello Prasi, you there? She may be disconnected. Let us wait for another few minutes. Yes. She is there actually. Yes, but uh, audio disconnected. It seems. Wait, I will call her. Yes.
Rajiv, you are back. Please unmute your mic. Unmute your mic, please. Yeah. Uh, again, share your screen. Uh, yes, I will share. Uh, from where did you end? Ma'am, from this slide only. You were continuing. Okay. Uh, hello. Yes. 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 Please continue. Yes. So, uh, uh, palliative care. Uh, the World Health Organization defines palliative care as an approach that improves the quality of life of patients, adults and children and their families who are facing problems associated with life-threatening illness, that is, for example, cancer. It prevents and relieves suffering through the early identification, correct assessment and treatment of pain and other problems, whether physical, psychological or spiritual. So, according to who, palliative care is of utmost important uh, in this lymphedema care. Uh, so, locations where palliative care can be delivered are hospices. Uh, usually, they name hospices in US, UK, all the countries, uh, where there is a special ward or unit that focuses on palliative care. That is the physical, psychological and spiritual care together. They have counselors and they have therapists, uh, lymphedema therapists, especially working for this. Hospital uh, palliative care support, home care teams, outpatient services, and daycare centers. Now we'll move to physiotherapy management. So the Chartered Society of Physiotherapists, uh, CSP, produced a document outlining the background and treatment of lymphedema. This document states that patient will undergo three to four weeks of intensive therapy, followed by a lifelong monitoring, which uh, includes self-management and six monthly uh, reviews. So the treatment of lymphedema should be specifically tailor based, based on the site, severity, uh, complexity, as well as their psychosocial status. Uh, so. The management of lymphedema is divided into two phases, that is intensive uh, care and maintenance stage. So the first one, which we are going to look is uh, decongestive lymphatic therapy. So decongestive lymphatic therapy uh, is discussed as gold standard care for lymphedema. So traditionally lymphedema is managed with DLT and it's based on four pillars, that is compression, a uh, massage, uh, which is now called as MLD, uh, that is manual lymphatic drainage, skin care, and exercises. However, routine intensive management uh, uses uh, using D, uh, DLT may not be appropriate due to weakness and fragility. So it must be modified and adopted according to the patient needs as it is tailor-made. So going to compression therapy, uh, patients with mild swelling can be managed in compression garments, either ready-made or made to measure. Palliative bandaging consists of layers of padding and short stretch bandaging over a cotton liner and will include bandaging the digits also for those who have uh, in upper limb or lower limb both. Here bandaging should be carried out or supervised by lymphedema practitioner only. So any, any of the physiotherapist cannot perform it. You have to be lymphedema therapist to uh, perform this, uh, the whole uh, DLT. So compression therapy consists of two main methods, that is multilayer lymphedema bandaging, MLBB, and compression garments. So MLBB management if compression garments are not suitable. So MLBB is usually used for the intensive stage, uh, like first four weeks. Uh, this, this can also be used in long term if the compression garments are not suitable for the patient or if they cannot afford it. So for the compression bandaging, what are the indications? So there's fragile damage or ulcerated skin distorted uh, limb shape, limb too large for compression garments, uh, areas of tissue thickening, lymphuria, uh, then a lymph 
Fangetia uh, pronounced skin folds. So uh, when we see it requiring bandaging, we have to look for uh, the pressure, how much pressure should be applied. So uh, we have to ask few questions. Uh, like a patient has neurological deficit, lipodema, uh, if pre uh, palliative fertility or reduced mobility, then we have to give reduced pressure. There is a, uh, what do you say? There is a um, proper uh, um, uh, to, hello? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, right. please continue. It's okay. Yes, yeah, so there is a calculation uh, using Lapsi's law, which is used to measure uh, how much pressure should be applied. So if the patient's having arterial disease, if yes, then uh, reduced pressure should be applied. Uh, if no, and if is obese uh, or elderly, then you have to modify accordingly with high pressure or standard therapy. Then if the patient's having chronic venous uh, insufficiency uh, or venous ulceration with lymphedema, accordingly, you have to give intensive therapy or venous disease. So, now, what, how much pressure to apply? So, for MLBB, it can be adapted to uh, suit the patient's need by either adjusting the pr uh, pressure, frequency of reapplication, bulk of bandage, and type of uh, bandage. If pressure is not applied correctly, venous and lymphatic flow can be compromised. Therefore, the proximal movement of fluid is reduced and swelling may be present in the extremities. So the pressure applied is calculated using Lapsi's law. So P pressure equals to T into N uh, into 4630 divided by C into W. Now T is uh, tension in the bandage, N is the number of layers uh, and uh, into 4630 divided by limb circumference and bend with, bandage width. So according to these, uh, the uh, pressure is measured and according to the patient's need, whether he needs more pressure or less pressure, you have to give the bandaging. Now looking at the compression garments, compression garments should be considered when patient is reaching the end of intensive phase of treatment. Once regular limb shape has been restored and the patient's skin is fully intact and robust, enough to tolerate the use of garments because they have to be worn for a longer duration of time. So if swelling, uh, so uh, for giving uh, compression garments, you have to look for uh, the stage of the lymphedema, uh, what's the severity, shape, size of the limb, skin resilience, ability to tolerate uh, dexter dexterity, that is the skillfulness of the uh patient like he will he wear uh is he going to wear it properly does he know how to wear we have to teach them then the lifestyle mo uh, mobility age psychological status so in compression garments if the swelling is not controlled within the first three months of wearing compression garments clinician and patient should consider further intensive therapy using mlb in order to bring the swelling under control. So if within th then you have to go back to intensive therapy. Compression garments are mainly for the maintenance stage, that is post-intensive therapy. Uh, now here, uh, the most important thing is skincare also. At both the intensive and uh, maintenance stages, it is important to emphasize the needs uh, for a skin care regime to maintain the skin integrity. So the main principles of skin care are uh, the skin should be washed daily, ensure skin folds are clean and dry, monitor skin changes, apply emollients that are the moisturizer, uh, avoid scented products, use vegetable uh, based products in tropical climates and avoid sunburn. So moving on to the exercises, based on new evidences, uh, traditional beliefs about effects of exercises on lymphedema have been disproven. 
so traditionally strenuous exercises was discouraging patients with lymphedema based on the belief that it may exaggerate the condition uh, however recent studies and systematic reviews contradict this statement so mainly elevation of the limb will help reduce the gravitational component of the swelling for example supporting the arm on a pillow or a cushion to prevent pooling at the elbow aerobic activities uh, stimulate lymphatic return and should be encouraged within patient's tolerance aerobic uh, exercises minimizes psychological distress and fatigue among cancer patients even those with advanced and widely spread diseases evidence suggests that uh, exercise supervised by a qualified professional that's a physiotherapist in the first instance uh, this will ensure correct technique and reduce uh, injury risk so uh, it can be concluded from a uh, body of evidences including large uh, rcts and systematic reviews that strenuous training as previously thought does not lead to development or worsening of lymphedema rather it improves the lymphatic drain so what what all exercises would we give so seeing at the upper limb uh, for first four days full abduction is uh, to be prevented only abduction till 90 degrees is allowed so then uh, we will progress with stretching we can give pnf techniques starting with rhythmic initiation uh, it is recommended that for all the lymphedema patients isotonic exercises are best uh, for the increased lymph flow and isotonic exercises should be performed for at least 15 to 30 repetitions uh, isometric exercises here are not recommended at all for the lymphedema patients uh, patients can do flexibility uh, exercises uh, aerobic exercises as i mentioned uh, diaphragmatic breathing along with all the exercises then patient can go for relaxation techniques such as yoga aquatic therapy helps uh, in lymphedema but the temperature should be 94 degree fahrenheit so here all all the exercises based on patient stage severity and psychological status should be tailor made or uh, from stretching to pnf to isotonic everything should be tailor made according to the patient's need uh, then moving on to manual and lymph simple lymphatic drainage so mld is highly effective in palliative setting ml warder came up with the method of man, uh, manual lymphatic drainage in 1936 he stated that mld along with other techniques such as deep breathing and improved diet would play a key role in lymphatic conditions uh, this method of massage uses gentle strokes such as effluragis uh, to enhance lymph drainage through lymphatic pathways the lymph uh, the treatment alone is not sufficient uh, to reduce lymphedema however it is recommended that mld is conducted by trained professionals in conjunction with the other components of dlt which we saw earlier so uh, in mld what all uh, would be included that is a uh, pressure manipulation can be there that is pet massage uh, the friction can be applied transversely or in a circular motion uh then there are uh, there is a scoop technique there is pump technique thumb circle technique uh here in all this uh device can also be used that is pneumatic compression therapy that is dimpress device um another form of this treatment is known as simple lymphatic drainage that is sld a simplified version of mld that can be taught to people with uh, lymphedema uh and they have to it's a uh, part of self management program that is uh, sld should be performed 10 to 20 minutes whereas mld should be performed for at least an hour so in teaching uh, sld uh, we should check uh, the technique uh, competency regularly then motivate uh, how how much the patient is motivated again the dexterity uh, time allocated for progressive teaching provide written instructions to the patient uh, then what are the indications and contraindications for providing mld uh, swelling at the root of the limb uh, trunk or uh, midline swelling uh, then provision of comfort or pain relief adjunct to pain management these are the indications 
now local contraindications are untreated thyroid dysfunction primary tumors and metastasis contraindications acute cellulitis renal failure unstable hypertension severe cardiac insufficiency hepatic cirrhosis with abdominal fluid superior vena cava obstruction and untreated tb or malaria these are the contraindications of mld slow repetitive movements are there uh, the circulation should move proximally to distally that is from proximal end to distal end of the limb but uh, the uh, a few uh, a few arrages or the uh, techniques should be from distal to proximal end it aims to increase lymph drainage without altering capillary function uh, alter interstitial pressures by varying hand movements uh, that is uh, all the movements with uh, all the techniques that is scoop uh, scoop technique pump technique uh, transverse and circular friction movements all the techniques uh, it incorporates breathing techniques deep diaphragmatic breathing to encourage drainage from deep abdominal lymph nodes and vessels and it should be performed up to 1 hour daily uh i have taken everything from the references these are the references uh, uh here uh, matrix rhythm therapy is also very much into use uh, nowadays and researches are being done it has uh, been proved uh, useful uh, in lymphedema so uh, that can also be used uh and this should be purely performed by lymphedema therapists only not by a physiotherapy practitioner uh exercises uh exercises and ml only exercises can be performed by physiotherapist mld has to be performed by a lymphedema therapist um thank you any questions thank you thank you so much uh, prachi buj it was a really a vast topic but you have given it in a nutshell way okay yes, in a limited yes. short of time okay yes sir so i thank you for a wonderful uh, session and i thank uh, principal and vice principal and other staffs of dr dv patel college of physiotherapy for supporting us uh, and uh, i thank our exrx of india team members we will go for a question and answer session would you like to take questions yes sir yeah okay